morning. Let's go ahead and start this morning off by worshiping the Lord.
If you have your Bibles, take them out and turn to Romans 8, 34. Romans 8, 34. Romans 8, 34 says this. Who is he that, con who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died? More than that, who was raised to life? Is that is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And I'd like to preach for a while this morning from the subject, Go Ask Dad. Father, I thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help me be accurate in teaching your word. Holy Spirit, give us open hearts and ears to hear and understand it and how we can apply it to our lives. And we do that for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Cassidy was, uh, and Cole were with us last week, and Cassidy brought a message, and in her, in her teaching, she was talking about how the idea of having a big brother, and that she always wanted to be like her big brother, and I thought it was interesting that I actually have some photographic evidence of that, what she was talking about. <laughs> now, in this picture, not only are they in the exact same pose and position, she's wearing an old Napomo baseball t-shirt of his. I mean, cut off at the sleeves, like his was cut off, and I just thought that was funny and it was an excuse to show my kids. So, <laughs> anyway, if my kids as I remember, I just thought that was funny. You know, it is true. We do have, uh, you know, that is common, and, and I know she, uh, uh, she adored her big brother when she was little. As they got older, I'm not so sure that was always the case. Uh, but anyways, there is a photographic evidence of what she was talking about. She also mentioned that how siblings, there's always one of them, whether there's two or 12 of them, but there's always that one sibling that you know when you need to go to mom and dad and ask mom and dad, can we do this, can we go here, can we have that, that there's one child that they're more likely to say yes to than the other one, right? And so that child always gets sent. It's a bummer if you're an only child, huh? <laughs> so, so anyway, so you better be the one that they they they, they like you. Be good. Uh, so uh, there's always that one when you have multiple kids who gets tasked with going and asking mom and dad. You go ask mom and dad. I don't. I bet you can't guess. I bet you can't guess in my family which one was always sent to ask mom and dad. One K. It wasn't K. Um, I do that now at work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I go, Chris, go, you go ask. Go ask, go ask, go ask, go ask. <laughs> So nothing has really changed that much. We used to go away sometimes, and when the kids were going to go away for a weekend, it's like, I just, I would just like walk. I'd walk into the house, and I'd, I could, the Holy Spirit would just be, was just like, I know something's going on here. I can sense it. Okay, what happened? What'd you do? You know, well, we almost burned the house down, but, you know, you could just... You can just sense it. So there is that one sibling, the one that has seems to have mom and dad trust. They have the you know, that child has favor with mom and dad that they get sent. And, and I'm sure that you know, I'm sure everybody in here was the child that got sent. Amen. You were the one that, that mom and dad trusted and, and would listen to you. So this got me to thinking that you know, really, what the Bible tells us the same thing. The Bible Bible really tells us that we can do the same thing and that there is this child that we should uh, send to God on our behalf to ask things on our behalf. He is that big brother that we should look up to, model ourselves after, and that in fact we are instructed to ask him to go ask dad. The Bible tells us to do this. So I want to look at some passages this today, this idea about going and asking dad. And of course, the idea of asking dad, asking mom, whatever, is that when we ask them, we want them to say yes. That yes, you can do that. Yes, you can have that. Yes, you can go there. And the Bible tells us how to go about being successful in asking dad. So I want to start by looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews 2, verse 11. And it says this. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. This is a very short passage of scripture, but it really informs us of quite a bit. The first thing it says is that we are not holy. Now, when you think about this in terms of going and asking a parent, 
that it means when <laughs> it means when you go ask that parent, they probably really aren't going to listen to you all that well. You are not, um, they're not really excited about giving you what you want. Uh, they don't trust you, okay? You have abused your privileges in the past, and I'm not really predisposed to say yes to what you want. That's why you don't send that child, amen? Because in this, in this case, in terms of Christian, Christian, our, our relationship with God through Jesus, it says we're not holy. But there is one who is. And it says that we are made ho uh, holy. Those who are made holy are of the same family. So we're not holy, but Jesus is. And when we come to Jesus and we go to God through Jesus, that his holiness is applied to us. And I'm sorry for really picking on Kate, but I don't know any other illustration. But this would be like Kate becoming Cassidy, okay? <laughs> and all of a sudden, mom and dad listen and trust, okay? Uh, <laughs> no, that's fair. No, it's fair. That's exactly right. This is the child that I once came home and found him and the neighbor boy with our daughter strung up between two trees. We were going to, in a slingshot. In a slingshot. Don't think she was and put a football helmet on her, and shoulder pads on her, and they were going to launch her to the creek. Okay? Was she willing? Oh, yeah. Because, because Big Brother thought it would be cool. So anything that Big Brother thought would be cool, she was in. So this is the child that I came home and found a burn mark in his brand new carpet because he tried to burn his grave card in his, in his room. Because it, the grades weren't good, okay? The burn mark is still there. I can show you. <laughs> and I could go on. But this is what we're saying. That when we come, we are not holy. But in Christ, we are holy. We are a part of the same bread. In fact, the good news is, is... Jesus is not ashamed, even in our unholiness, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. And I just want to say, when I say brothers, I mean brothers and sisters, okay? This is not exclusive to just guys. It's, he's not ashamed of us. We are members of the same family. And he does not get tired when we have a relationship with him. He does not get tired of going to the Father on our behalf. Jesus never, in fact, he wants us and tells us to do that. We are siblings and members of the same family. Romans 8.29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, brothers and sisters. Now, one thing I want to point out before I get into this a little bit more is, a lot of people use this passage to say, look at this, we are predestined to be saved. It's not an individual personal choice. It says we're predestined. That is not what it's saying. What does it say we're predestined to? We're predestined to do what? We're predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Not that we're predestined. God's saying, if you're going to be saved, then this is what it looks like. If you're going to, I predetermined that the model of our new lives is to be like Christ. So we are predestined to live our lives after Christ to conform to his likeness. Why? So that it says that he is the firstborn of many. He's the firstborn, but we are all his brothers and sisters, and we are to look like him, to model like him. It'd be again like looking up to that older sibling and saying, I want to be just like them. If they're wearing a cut-off t-shirt, I want to wear a cut-off t-shirt, all right? I want to be just like them. And again, Jesus is happy for us to do that. We are predestined to look like him. He is our model. He's the firstborn of what? Many brothers and sisters. That means we are family. We are siblings. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. And he is our big brother. All right? And that means that if we are brothers and sisters, we have a common dad. We have a common parent. And that God is our father. So let me ask you this. If we're predestined to look like Jesus, and uh, and we know that people have you know parents kind of have that child that looks to do more than the other one. Who do you think of all of God's children, God likes the best? Come on, let's just admit. But, you know, we parents always like to say, we don't have favorites. And that's 
pretty much true. I'm sure there are some favorites that have parents that have favorites. But for the most part, we love our kids. You know, they are different, but we love them, not one more than the other. But in this case, you know what? I, I'm pretty sure that God has a favorite. Hello? Who, who's his favorite? Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Jesus is the favorite child, right? He is the firstborn among many siblings. In fact, if we were not in Christ or saved through the work of Christ on the cross, we wouldn't be his children. It's Jesus. Jesus makes it all happen. When you boil all this down today, folks, really, it's all about Jesus. You know, I love to teach, and there's all kinds of different theological insights and, you know, uh, spiritual understandings and all these things. But when you boil it all down, it's really simple. It's all about Jesus. Are you in a saving relationship with him or not? Period. Jesus is dad's favorite child. There is no doubt about this. It makes sense then to me to have Jesus go and ask dad on my behalf. If he's the favorite child, then I want him to be the one that I'm going to send to ask dad on my behalf. And that's exactly what scripture tells us to do. John 16, verses 23 and 24. It says, in that day, you will no longer ask me me anything. This is Jesus speaking. He said, I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be made complete. Jesus is saying that we are to ask but to ask in his name. When G because when we ask in his name it's like, ask, it's like Jesus asking on our behalf. When we ask in the name of Jesus, we're not saying because of me. If Randy goes to, the, to, to God in my sinful, flawed, failed nature and say, God, I, I do this for me, what's his response probably going to be? I'm what? I'm disobedient. I'm sinful. I'm flawed. I'm separated. I'm selfish. All those things. What's his response probably going to be? No. You, you, can I always put, do you know why... When I say that, I want you to understand something. God doesn't tell us no because he wants to be mean to us or he's, you know, that, that's not the point. What do you give, if you have a child who misbehaves all the time, okay, misbehaves, doesn't listen, you know, and then you're in the store and they go, I want, buy me this, buy me this, buy me that, and do this and do that for me. And you do it. What are you creating? You're creating a monster or a spoiled child, right? God doesn't raise spoiled children. So when we are those disobedient children and yet we want dad to give us our way, what? Should his response be just like your response would be? No. No. But when I go in the name of Jesus, based on Jesus's, not on mine, based on Jesus's faithfulness, Jesus's relationship to the Father, Jesus's holiness, Jesus's righteousness, based on that, he says, yes. Because I, I don't deserve it. I'm not. But, but that's why Jesus said, hey, Randy, if you go on your own, you're in trouble. Here, use my name. Does that make sense? Use my name. Go in my Whatever you ask in my name, it's like Jesus asking. So we are given authority. We are instructed. It is not pride or arrogance or anything like that to use the name of Jesus Jesus instructs us to use his name. And then it even says, if we do this, we ask and we'll receive, and our joy will be complete. Does anybody have trouble with their joy being complete? All right? That, also, that sounds like a good thing, right? It says, if we do this, then we'll receive, and our joy will be made complete. Why is asking in Jesus' name the same as Jesus asking himself? Well, let's look at 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. If you want to get to God, there is only one mediator. Mediator is who we have to go through, the person who is going to represent us. I open with the fact of saying that Jesus is a, lives ever to intercede for us. The, the idea of him interceding 
is that it's tied with he is our mediator. He goes and he mediates on our behalf. He intercedes for us. There's only one. There's only one. And it is not the pastor. It is not your Sunday school teacher. It is not your, you know, it is not your, it is not your parent. It's Jesus himself. He is the one mediator. He is the one person that God listens to. God hears us when we come through the one and only mediator. So we're told to come in his name, to ask in his name. Because it's not about who we are, it's about who Jesus is and what he did on our behalf. It's all about Jesus. It's all about our big brother. Okay? And we should be, we should be thrilled that he is willing to call us his brothers and sisters, and to be our big brother. But he is our mediator. That's what he does. That's the role that he plays. It's one of his primary roles. John 10, 7, I'm going to read verse 7, and I'm going to skip 8 and go to 9. It says, Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pastor. We can come in and go out. We can. Jesus is the gate. There is no other gate. It's another way of saying he's the only mediator. He's the only one gate. He's the only way to God. It's only as we come to God through Jesus. Because I have no righteousness of my own. What does righteousness mean? It means I have no right standing with God. I have no standing with God. I have no position with God because I am, I am failed, I'm flawed, I'm sinful, I'm disobedient. Now, I know all you guys are perfect holy and righteous and have never done you know, anything displeasing to God. Well, I, I say that very confess. I have to come to God through Jesus because I'm not. There is a gate. There is a way, though. Before Jesus, there was no access into God's presence. When Jesus came and he went to the cross and he paid for our sins and he rose to new life so that we can also have new life and be born again. Because what, you know, I, have you ever heard this? Uh, I, I remember um, there was this thing called the Jesus People Movement. Anybody remember the, the Jesus People Movement was like early 70s. And a lot of young people were getting saved. And it was really uh, took off in Southern California. Calvary Chapel kind of was birthed. It was a big part of this. The Calvary Chapel Church, as we know today, Chuck Smith. Um, and I've heard people, guys talk like they would stand at the ocean, in, you know, in California and just baptize young people from sun up to sundown, just big, long, continuous line. People were getting saved. And it was this whole big, uh, they talk about being born again, born again, born again. And it was, well, there's always a big movement like that. There's always a pushback. So the idea of being born again, then it became a negative. Because it's like, oh, you're one of those born again Christians. You ever heard you ever hear that? One of those born again, like and like it's a negative. Folks, I got news for you. There's only one kind of Christian. Born again. If you're not born again, you're not a Christian. Alright? John 3, Jesus tells them clearly in John in John 3 3, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no other kind. So we need to have. This new birth needs to take place. I can't do that. It's available to me through Jesus. I, when Jesus came and he paid the price, he died for sins, and then he rose again so that I could also be born again to a new life, there was a gate that was created that didn't previously exist. It wasn't there before. There was no other way to come into the presence of God. Remember, in the Old Testament, only the priest could come into the tabernacle, and they could only come if they were called or once a year to present sacrifices, and they had to be perfectly cleansed and present sacrifices to do it. Now, we can come any time into God's presence through the gate, through the one mediator that is Jesus Christ, our big brother. And I can come any time because I am made holy, righteous, and pure because of his work, not because of my own, but because his work is perfect. It has always existed. I do not have to go and get saved time and time again. I do not have to go and be baptized time and time again. It is always in effect. The gate is open. We, the gate of Jesus Christ is always open. I can always come anytime into his presence. So... 
He is, I, I, I ask in his name because he is the one mediator. He is the one gate by which I can come into God's presence. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able to save completely those to, who come to God through him because he always lives to in, intercede for them. He always lives to intercede for them. Because of that, I can always come to the Father because one of the, primary, one of the primary roles of Jesus after his death and resurrection is now to intercede for us. He, that's what he does. Yes, he already died for our sins. He's not getting back on the cross. All right? If you wear a cross, you know, jewelry or whatever, that's great. I would, I would suggest that make sure it's a cross that doesn't have Jesus on it. He's not on the cross anymore. All right? He's already done it. He said it is finished. It's complete. Everything that's necessary has been accomplished. That's why we're told that it is by his stripes we have been healed. It's in the past tense. The work that was necessary for our healing has already been done. And that was Jesus allowing his body to be broken so that ours can be healed. It's done. So we're told that um, uh, um, you know, we're, we're, it, it, he's not getting back on the cross for us. He's not being raised from the dead again for us. The tomb is empty. He's not there any longer. Those things were Jesus' first, most important role. It's already been done. Now the role that he's fulfilling is to live to ever intercede for us. That's what he's doing now all the time. And where's he at? We're told at least five times in the New Testament, he is seated at the right hand of God. Why is he at the right hand of God? Because he's always going, hey, Dad, Randy, you know, he's, you know... Literally, I mean, he is. I, mean, I don't know if he's elbowing him, but you know, <laughs> you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. That is where he's at the right hand of God. He's there to intercede on our on our behalf. In fact, I love Ephesians two six says that I, you, if you are a, a Christian, if you're born again, that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. If Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and I'm seated with Him in heavenly realms, where am I seated right now? I am seated at the right hand of God. I know y'all thought I was missing. Uh, but no, in the spiritual realm, I am seated at the right hand of God. I think about how Paul writes to the, 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 the Galatians and says that we are clothed with Christ. When God looks at me, he sees Christ. He sees Jesus. I'm clothed with Christ. He was trying an airplane. Oh, it's downstairs trying to the cheap select the wrong Apple Apple TV. We have an Apple TV. If you're not into Judy, I was laughing this morning because somebody made the mistake of asking her about going back to school. And next thing you know, it was Chromebooks and Google Classroom and scanning PDFs, and I know this person had no idea what she was talking about. Not and that's not a criticism, you just we have Apple TVs, and it's downstairs and upstairs, and she selected the wrong one. Anyways, um, I'll give her a hard time afterwards. Uh, we are, we are, we come to God, clothed with Christ, seated in His in His presence, at the right hand of God. His job is to intercede for us. That's His job. We should. Let him do his job. When we come to the Father, we come through the big brother. Hey, big brother, go ask Dad on my behalf because I know he listens to you. In fact, you told me to ask you to go ask Dad. This is how we do it. People sometimes don't always understand this, but we pray to the Father in Jesus' name as empowered by Holy Spirit. Okay? Got that? When I was a first new Christian, I didn't hear, what's all these different people you keep talking about? We talk about God over here, Jesus over here, Holy, I don't know, the Father, the Son, what is up? Okay, that's the way it works. We're praying to God, the Heavenly Father, through or in Jesus' name, as the Holy Spirit leads us and powers us to do that. So that's the way we pray. But ultimately, we're going to God through the Son. Let me look at Hebrews 8, starting in verse 3. Hebrews 8, starting in verse 3 through 6. It says, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one, the one being Jesus, 
also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve in a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything in accordance to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator, remember mediator we talked about, is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. In verse 3, we're told that the priests were required to come to God bringing gifts and sacrifices when they would go into God's presence. We don't have to do that because Jesus has already been the gift and the sacrifice, and it is finished. It's done. We no longer have to do that. It was necessary for Jesus to bring a gift and sacrifice also, but that gift and sacrifice was himself. He's done it. He didn't do it the way the earthly priest did it. He did it the way this, him, the heavenly priest did it. It's done. He brought himself as the gift of sacrifice. In verse 6, it's Jesus, it says that Jesus' ministry is superior. So, well, we have the men, the priests on earth, setting an example for us. His ministry, his mediatorship, his intercession is superior to those. So when they would come, I mean, that was good. God instructed them under the old covenant to come before him to bring the gifts of the sacrifice, and that was good. But Jesus paid the price with his own life as the gift of the sacrifice. His, his uh, uh, ministry is superior to their ministry. His sacrifice is superior to their sacrifice. And that means that his asking dad is superior to their asking dad. It's the best. There is nothing better. His ministry is superior. And not only is, is his ministry superior, his covenant that we have with God through Jesus Christ is superior. God made all kinds of promises under the old covenant. You'll find them in Deuteronomy 28. We won't take time to learn there. It says if you obey God, this is the old covenant. He says, you'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the country. You'll be blessed coming, and you'll be blessed going. You'll be blessed. I mean, it's all this blessed, 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 blessed. That's pretty good, being blessed in all these ways. The covenant that we have is superior to all of that. That's pretty good. Why? Because Big Brother goes on our behalf and asks Dad. He intercedes for us. It says, Dad, I'm interceding for Randy. Dad, I'm interceding for Jason. Dad, I'm interceding for Rosie. I know that they're not perfect. I know they've made mistakes. I know at times they've been disobedient to you and you've done, they've done things that you haven't pleased you. But I'm here on their behalf. Trust me, Dad, they're okay. Go ahead. Take care of them. Bless them. Meet their need. I vouch for them. I vouch for them. Why? Because my sacrifice, my death, and my resurrection is applied to them because they're following me as their Savior and Lord. That's what he's saying. That's, it, it is a superior. All we do is we come to Jesus, and he goes to Dad, and he takes the rest. Go ask Dad. Jesus, ask Dad on my behalf because I know he'll listen to you. He is our mediator. He is our go-between. And it, this is what it's all about, the person of Jesus. There is no other. Folks, I'm going to make this real simple and, and close this. There is no other reason that God will listen to you other than Jesus. You can light as many candles as you want. You can do as many Christian or whatever religious ritual, rituals that you want to do. It doesn't mean a thing. The only thing that matters is that Jesus speaks on our behalf. That he mediates or intercedes for us. That's God is only listening to Jesus. So you really, it's really important that Jesus speaks well of you as he intercedes for you, okay? Because it's all about what Jesus did for us. And we partake in that as we surrender our life to him and become, he becomes our Savior and our Lord. And I want to make one other quick point here. I, you know, I, I, I'm... This is a, by my standards, this is a fairly brief message today, okay? So I got a few extra minutes here. I want to make this really clear. 
when we talk to people about Jesus, it's often presented that, you know, we need to be forgiven of our sin. We need to be forgiven for all the bad things we've done. Isn't that? And so we come to Jesus, and he died on the cross for our sins, and I'm forgiven, and then I can be saved. Isn't that the way it's often presented? That's not untrue, but let me tell you something. But that puts a, really puts kind of a guilt on people, right? Let me tell you something that's more true. And I've shared this before. It's been a little. What's more true is that we're not saved from the bad things we've done. We're being literally saved from who we are. If you plant corn, what grows? Plant watermelon seeds, what grows? Watermelon. If you plant, if sinful seed of man is passed along, what happens? You get a yeah. sinful person. You get what? Seattle. Oh, you get Seattle. <laughs> You're trying to get me in trouble. I'm already in, I'm already in enough trouble for the Gullah Bull flag I posted. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Anyways. Um, you get sin because all seed produces after its own kind. Every human being has been sinful at conception. As Psalm 51 5 says, we were sinful in our mother's womb. I haven't done anything. I haven't even had a thought. How can I be sinful? Because we're the sin, because we're the product of sinful fallen seed. There's nothing we can do about it. We're all in the same boat. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody's worse than anybody else. We're all the same. We're all produced by sinful seed ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. We're being saved from who we are. It is not a judgmental condemnation of you. It's a statement of that's how it works. That's why Jesus had to be conceived of a virgin. Otherwise, he would have been the product of fallen seed, he would have been sinful, and would have not have been an adequate sacrifice for us. He's the only one. He is, it's all about him. So we don't come on our behalf, we ask big brother to go ask dad for us. Because he's the only one that God is listening to. I need, I'm going to skip a little bit. Just, I'm going to throw in a couple little things here and then I'm going to skip some of this. We have some specific things that we are told to ask the Father for in Jesus' name and he'll give it to us. John 14, 16 says, and I will ask the Father, this is Jesus mediating for us, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counsel of the Holy Spirit to be with you forever. So, how do we receive the Holy Spirit in our lives? Jesus asked on our behalf. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give it to you. All right? So there you go. Great promise. We go to the big brother asks. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Who is it? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, if not uh, only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's all about what Jesus did. He is the atoning sacrifice. What's it say? He speaks on our behalf. And he says, Dad, I know Randy's a screw-up, but he's really not that bad of a guy. And at least he's trying. He confesses it. He realizes it. And he's come to me for salvation and for me to be Lord of his life. Dad, it's okay. He's, he's okay. He speaks on my behalf. He paid the price for the forgiveness for my sin. Let me close with this. Hebrews 4. 14 through 16. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet is without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's saying we have a great high priest. That priest is Jesus. Amen? It says that uh, he's, he sympathizes with us. With all my shortcomings and all my failures, it says he sympathizes with them. Because he's been tempted in the same way that I have. But yet because he's without sin, he was able to be an appropriate sacrifice. But because of that, I love this verse 16. 
We can approach the throne of grace. We can come in to the throne room of God. And it says we can, with confidence. I'm confident that God hears and answers my prayers. Not because of what I've done. But because of what Jesus did. And because he opened that gate. He's my mediator. He lives to intercede for me. I can come into the very throne room of God because the gate is open, the curtain is open, and I can ask what I need, and I will receive it because God listens to Jesus, my mediator. I can come confidently. When you pray in Jesus' name, do you pray with confidence? Or you might say faith. Or do you go, man, I hope God hears me. That's not what it says. It says that we can come boldly with confidence. Not arrogantly, but confidently. Not with pride, but with boldness and confidence. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. And what he did. Because I know Dad, my Heavenly Father, listens to him. So I asked Big Brother to go ask Dad on my behalf. And it's not taking advantage of the situation. It's what I've been instructed to do from God's word. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him being Savior and Lord of our life. We can ask him to ask dad. And that and those promises that he's made to us are for us. And we get them that way. Let me close. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. You have been appointed to do what? What's it say? Bear fruit. What does that mean? It means that you've been appointed. God has determined. God has wants you. God you know, has predetermined that you will produce good things in your life. You've been appointed. That's God's appointment to you. Produce good things, good fruit. How do you do it? When you ask in Jesus' name. So, go ask Dad. We shouldn't shy away from asking Dad. Jesus instructs us to ask Dad in his name. Just wanted to kind of play off this idea of what Cassidy had kind of mentioned last week about this idea of having a big brother. And looking up to that big brother and following him and, and, and having, you know, somebody, that one child is going to go and always ask dad and mom and they're going to listen to him. This is, this, this, that's scriptural. Go ask dad in the name of Jesus. He, his purpose, his intent is to intercede for us. And God listens to the son. So we want to be in him. So don't be afraid. This is how we do it. This is how we pray. This is how we go to God the Father to receive the things that we have need of. And it says we can do that boldly and confidently. Confidently, we can go ask Dad. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word and how much it teaches us. We can understand you. We can know you. We can know how to live the life that you have called us to. Lord, how we can have a relationship with you. It's just so rich and so good. So I thank you, Lord, for speaking to us by your word this morning. I pray, God, each one of us, we may have different needs, be at different places in our lives, but I believe that your word can be made alive and personal to each one of us. So, Lord, do that for us today. Wherever we are, whatever's going on, Lord, show us how we can apply your word to our life in a way that not only glorifies you, but, Lord, our joy is made complete. Lord, now blessings upon every home and family represented here. Go with us, Lord, as we go to celebrate this time of baptism, Lord, all for your glory and honor. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.